everyone. This is Elizabeth Reagan of the Society of Plastics Engineers, and I'd like to welcome you to today's eLive presentation. Bioplastics, new generation polymer materials for reducing carbon footprint and improving environmental performance. Our program today will be about one hour in length, including a question and answer session following the presentation. I will instruct you at that time on how to address your questions to the speaker. Also, if you would like a handout from this presentation, you may print one by pressing the handout button at the top of the screen. The icon appears with three white sheets of paper. If you have any technical difficulties during the program, please press star zero on your telephone to contact customer care. They will be happy to assist you. Today's presenter is Ramani Narayan. Dr. Narayan has 104 referee publications in leading journals to his credit, 15 patents, edited three books and one expert dossier in the area of bio-based polymeric materials. His research encompasses design and engineering of sustainable bio-based products, biodegradable plastics and polymers, reactive extrusion polymerization and processing, studies in polymer biodegradation and composting. He works on LCA protocols for assessing a product's environmental stewardship. He's also on the board of directors of ASTM International, a premier international standard setting organization. He chairs the Committee on Environmentally Degradable Plastics and Bio-Based Products and the Plastics Terminology Committee. Dr. Narayan also chairs the Scientific Committee of Biodegradable Products Institute, North America, a biodegradable and bio-based plastics trade industry organization. He has testified before U.S. congressional hearings on the biodegradable and bio-based plastics issues. He's also won several awards, including the Governor's University Award for Commercialization Excellence, as well as many others. Dr. Narayan, I'll let take it from here. Thank you. Good morning to all. Um, you have the first slide in front of you, and what I'm going to talk about is bioplastics. And use of bioplastics is the next generation polymers for carbon footprint reduction and improving environmental performance. So let's begin. Let's start by framing the question for this presentation. What is this all about? And what this is all about is carbon. So we're talking about carbon. We live in a carbon economy. We are driven by a carbon economy, and everything we touch, feel, use is based on carbon. So the question really comes to looking at the carbon footprint or profile of a product, a company, a university, or a country. It doesn't matter. So what we're talking about is carbon footprints and profiles. And this is important, therefore, we want to say or we want to evaluate how do we manage carbon in a environmentally responsible manner? What is the impact or effect of carbon emissions on the uh, environment? And you have been reading about it, hearing about it, about CO2 emissions, man-made CO2 emissions, related to global warming, related to climate change. We will address that issue, but fundamentally, we want to talk about managing carbon, right? And the question being posed to industry, to researchers, to engineers, to scientists, what are you doing to reduce your product's carbon footprint or profile? And the goal is, as you can see in the slide, how do you go to a zero carbon or a carbon neutral footprint? That's what we are talking about. Okay? Now, in addition to the carbon footprint, we are focusing on carbon, we cannot forget the total environmental footprint or profile. In other words, we do everything possible to manage carbon in a environmentally responsible manner and then mess up everywhere else, throw out more emissions, uh, consume more energy, then we defeat the very purpose of managing carbon. So we cannot lose track of other environmental impacts as we look at the carbon footprint. All right. 
So, the value proposition in the use of bioplastics is that by switching or using a biorenewable feedstock, it is possible to reduce a product's carbon footprint and move to a zero carbon or a carbon neutral footprint. Number two, it provides or the potential to provide a positive environmental footprint or profile and we do this using life cycle assessment tools and methodology. So the take home on this slide is as follows. By switching to manufacture your product from a petrol feedstock to a biorenewable feedstock, you will be able to reduce your carbon footprint. That is the value proposition. That is the hypothesis. And what we want to do in the next uh, part of our lecture series is to look at how this happens, why it is so, and elaborate on the details of that. So let's go to the next slide. Right? In this slide, we define what the learning objectives of this presentation is. How do you incorporate biocontent and how does that allow you to have a reduced or a carbon neutral footprint? Two, how can you identify and quantify biocontent in your product? You make a product, how do you quantify it? How do you identify it? Three, how do you define a bio-based product? Obviously, you're making it from a bio-feedstock. You make a computer part, an auto part, and you say, well, I used a biological feedstock to make it. Well, how do you define it? How do you identify it? How do you quantify it? And what about biodegradability and end-of-life option for bio-based products? What's the relationship between biodegradability and bio based Do they mean the same thing? Are they different? How do we differentiate that? Then the first thing we want to know, and keep this in mind as we move through the next series of slides, is the following, that bio-based or bio or renewable all have the same meaning in the context of what we're talking about. So you hear in Europe generally talk about renewable content. In the US we talk more bio-based or just bio. All of them mean the same thing. So this is what at the end of the lecture series you need to check off with your friends saying, yes, I know what bio-content incorporation means. I know how to quantify it, how to identify it and why it is useful in reducing the carbon footprint and also why it is useful in improving environmental performance. Okay? All right. So let's get started. Now, before we go into the details of the uh, value proposition, let's have some very clear understanding of the terminology. Bio-based, bio or renewable, is directly related to the feedstock focus. In other words, it is using a biorenewable feedstock as opposed to a petrol feedstock. And the focus of this is on reducing your carbon footprint. Okay? And we're using biorenewable feedstocks to make the next generation of uh, plastics, chemicals, products, what, and other uh, similar products. All right. Biodegradability, on the other hand, is a functional property attribute to be designed and engineered into a bio-based product when needed or necessary. It is an end-of-life option with disposal systems like composting, anaerobic digestion. So biodegradability is an end-of-life option. It is a property attribute to be built into your product when needed or necessary. Bio-based or renewable has got to do with the use of a feedstock for reducing carbon footprint. It's the beginning of life. So that's the differentiation between bio-based and biodegradable. All bio-based products are not biodegradable. All biodegradable products are not bio-based. So keep that in mind as we move along. 
Finally, let's introduce one more complication, and that is biomaterials. Now, this is used a lot in the context of biomedical applications. And in this space, any material, metal, plastic, ceramic, which is implanted into the body is considered a biomaterial. So a metal is a biomaterial if you put it in a body. When we are talking bio-based, we are not talking about this at all. We're talking about a organic, renewable, bio feedstock. So keep that in mind and keep these terminologies in mind as we go along. So the next slide we're talking about is to show you how the value proposition of a bio-renewable feedstock makes sense. And we're talking about the global carbon cycle, right? In this case, inorganic carbon is present in the atmosphere as CO2, as you're seeing up in your slide. This inorganic carbon is converted to organic carbon, organic matter, carbohydrates, biomass, in a process we all studied in high school, photosynthesis. And the schematic on your slide shows the conversion of inorganic carbon to organic matter using sunlight as the energy source. We call this photoautotrophs. Photo is the light, autotroph fixation, and algae, plants, and bacteria fix inorganic carbon or convert inorganic carbon to organic matter. So this is the first step in the carbon cycle of nature. Okay? Now, the amount of carbon dioxide present in the atmosphere, and we like this, is around 328 parts per million. This is an important number. It's a very small number. And the point I want to make here is that carbon is distributed in different environmental compartments. In the atmosphere, the, the value is around 328. And as you know, the debate is around what is the acceptable level of CO2, which is a heat-trapping gas in the atmosphere. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So keep that in mind as we move along. So let's go to the next slide. And in this part, what we are addressing is this issue about relating the CO2 and similar heat-trapping gases and its relation to global warming and, and the uh, climate change associated with it. Before the Industrial Revolution, this value of 328 was around 250. Now, CO2 and similar heat tra trapping gases is important. If you take all of it away, then we would have a cold, frigid planet, and life as we know will not exist. If the value of this CO2 in the atmosphere increases to very high levels, obviously it is going to have an effect on increasing the planet's temperature. It's a cause and effect because that's what the heat trapping gases do. So the debate is very simple. We may not agree on what this value has to be absolute. Is it 400? Is it 450 parts per million? when there is going to be catastrophic failure. But you will agree that if we do nothing and simply keep on putting out more CO2 into the atmosphere, the fact that CO2 is a heat-trapping gas will result in the planet's temperature being increased with its attendant eco-problems that come with it. So if we can manage carbon, so the more prudent approach is to manage carbon so that we can maintain the 